All right, so welcome to module three in the Compassion Alchemy Meditation course. Um, as I was mentioning, um, when I saw that some of us had been uh, previously beautified before coming to this class, um, this will be a unique, probably in, in the field of meditation, my guess is that this particular retreat um, is unique amongst a lot of what we'll find out there. So um, in my experience, you have, you sort of got like the meditative traditions, which at one, one extreme is like a Vipassana retreat, right? Where you're not even supposed to do any yoga. Like it's just, you just do the sitting there. There isn't anything else except for that. And then on the other extreme, you've got like ecstatic dance retreats or you know emotional breathwork trainings or something like that where they don't really claim to be doing meditation necessarily it's more about expression and often you'll see these as um, kind of two different realms you know meditation is about calming down and in the worst cases in my opinion um, emotions are uh, subtly or explicitly taught to be repressed in meditation systems. Um, have you ever had this idea, you know, of like, you know, oh, this these kindly Buddhist priests, and they're all <laughs> suppressing their emotions all the time for inner peace. Um, that does really happen. And then there are others who, you know, are doing something more holistic, but there still can be this thought that like a, a real yogi is just this benign, equanimous, boring, neutral person <laughs> uh, all the time, right? And we get these strange dichotomies um, that have been, uh, maybe we'll talk about why in this in this presentation today, but um, they've sort of been enshrined in culture that like spiritual people are sort of set apart. They might not have partnerships. They might need to be in silence and have sort of like special diets that they follow all the time. And that is a part of meditative practice because it's a part of how one learns to strongly direct the focus of their intention, right? If you go into that Vipassana retreat and you don't do any yoga or Tai Chi, the attention really has to hone in onto that meditative style that you're cultivating that day. Or if you take a period, you know, as a young person or as an older person where you decide to be celibate for a while and, you know, eat a particularly veganic diet or something, the attention hones in in a way that it doesn't do if you're going out for beers with your buddies all the time. So there's a part for that on the meditative path. But because of that, I have found at least, maybe the tides are changing, but I found when I was coming up, there was this sense of like, okay, now here's spiritual life. And then here's the rest of what people might do with their life. And they're, they're sort of in these different categories. And today's workshop is all, kind of all about this part in the middle where you live an abundant, emotional, impassioned, wild, diverse life as a spiritual practice as a spiritual practice. So I don't know, does that sound fun to you? Boring, uh, not what I expect, I want my money back. Okay, cool. Um, and so we will be doing um, quite a number of meditative practices in that vein to play with that. And we'll talk about kind of where that flows in the, the um, setup of this Compassion Alchemy system. Um, and just by review, you've already done two different retreats, a lot of you, um, which should, should have had their unique feel, right? The first one was all about like comfort and uh, settling, feeling good and savoring. And, you know, there was the explicit instruction, right? Like, hey, if you don't want to sit up, you should lay down. <laughs> and hey, if you fall asleep during this meditation, you probably needed the rest, um, you know, and that's level one. Level two then is a little more on the hardcore. Um, and I, in my experience, our last retreat reflected that in that it's similar to the Zen or Vipassana retreats where it's like, okay, sit, focus, 
have some tea, come back and sit, focus, get a little Dharma talk, come back and sit, <laughs> focus. And these have to do with the stages that we are exploring in this model that I've developed um, called the compassion alchemy uh, system. So um, let's do a quick, oh, first I'll tell you the logistics of the day, and then we'll do a quick overview of where today's course lands in that compassion alchemy framework. That's the word I want, framework. I almost said hierarchy, which would have been wrong. Framework. Um, so logistics, framework, and then we'll do our first practice and really get ourselves grounded in with some meditation. Sound nice? Excellent. Okay, logistics. So those of you who have been before here, been here before, uh, know that we are going to go from 1030 to, gosh, I don't remember though, did we do till 530 last time or till five o'clock? Five o'clock, yes, because then we do an hour and a half lunch and it balances things all out, right? So we're going to go 1030, 1130, 1230, one, then we take a break till 230 and then we come back and do the afternoon. I'll redo that math later and make sure I'm telling you correctly, but I think that's right. 1030 to one, 230 to five, and those should be equal portions. <laughs> um, so that's the uh, that's kind of the logistics. And then we'll have a 15 minute break in the morning session and a 15 minute break in the, in the afternoon session, you know, or maybe two tens. We'll, we'll, we have to feel how it flows, right? So um, you should get a number of periods of sitting um, which is nice if you're really coming to kind of retreat like I actually am today. Our last uh, our last mini retreat online was so restorative to me um, that I was like, let's do that again. Let's do less talking and more sitting, sitting, sitting. <laughs> um, so we will have some, some very immersive practice sessions. Um, and then today there are a few, I think, really neat theoretical elements uh, to cover. So those are our basic logistics. Um, the timing. And if you have a question, you can always put them in the chat box. Um, and then we will have uh, time for Q&A, verbal back and forth Q&A as well. So then in, where are we in the model? Well, you are in a free course called the Compassion Alchemy Meditation Training. And um, the reason it's free is because it's a work in progress. I'm developing it. I've taught meditation for a lot of years. I've been a trained and certified meditation instructor for like decades now, like at least more than one decade, which is pretty cool. Um, and have also taught holistic human development from some different models for about that time. But recently I felt very inspired to kind of weave those two spheres of instruction together. Um, there are a couple of sources for this inspiration. One, um, about seven or eight years ago now, I had a really hard experience in a meditation retreat that um, destabilized me quite a bit for a good five or seven years. Um, and so it became my mission at that time, just for my own sake, really, um, to figure out like, whoa, I'd been meditating for years and most of the time it just made things better. Why this time did it make things so much worse? And I really got a taste of something I knew intellectually that meditation is not one size fits all. Um, it actually, there are so many different things called meditation. And then there are so many different of us that like, who knows what sort of chemistry is going to happen when you mix them together. Um, but hidden in um, the more kind of non-dual systems of the world. So um, I study uh, Buddhist Tantra. Um, I study esoteric Taoist alchemy um, and Sufism I actually studied, which is uh, the mystic tradition in Islam. And in all of these traditions, um, I found they actually have something of a pre-modern science of knowing which type of meditations to do at which phases in your uh, development or in your personal life 
or in the phase of like your energy body, if your acupuncturist says, oh, you've got liver wind, there are meditations to do and not to do until they you come back and their pulse says, oh yeah, your liver wind calmed down. Um, and so there's this whole kind of science. So that was, that was one of the first uh, inspirations for the work in progress that you are uh, a part of today. Um, because I wanted to look into this vast repertoire that I knew existed and try to figure out what the heck was wrong with me <laughs> um, and what to do about it. But then as I thought about it and started to read some of the literature, I came across some really um, kind of disturbing news that there is a small percentage of people who go to these like Vipassana retreats and Taoist yoga retreats and stuff like that and actually have severe psychological breaks afterward and need to be institutionalized, or sometimes tragically, they lose their lives because of how the meditation destabilized them, right? Um, and I thought, combined with the sort of vitriol that I've seen in the New Age community and different spiritual communities over the last number of years, where everybody's... Uh, idea about what nefarious forces are working in the world and who's the villain and who's the savior, you know, have just been like on vast display. Um, I felt like, wow, wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if the world of spiritual practice and spiritual development and introspection was informed by some evidence-based developmental psychology on the one hand, and if the two of these actually could be informed by that repertoire of non-dual traditions that already that has already worked out, you know, like the, the tantric systems, they've already worked out like, oh, if you tend toward this, you should do this type of meditation. If you tend toward that, you should do this type of meditation. And also for some people, if your ego is too uh, brittle, you know, they break it very carefully in one way. But if your ego is too flabby, they actually build that thing up before they teach you how to dissolve it. And so it's not a process where you're just sort of like throwing spaghetti noodles at the wall or whatever that analogy is and see what sticks. That's right. That is a real analogy. You're throwing it at the wall and see what sticks. Um, it's not haphazard like that. But most of us moderns, one, and then a lot of people in legitimate spiritual traditions, we don't think about it scientifically with you know whether you want to think of that as like big laboratory studies or just your own sort of empirical observation we kind of just take what's been handed down or what feels good what matches our confirmation bias and that i believe is a disservice to ourselves and uh, perhaps the evolution of our society into a more kind and loving place so that's uh what I'm about. If you're not into that, it's a Zoom meeting. You can sil silently click leave meeting and no one will even know. I'm not offended. I'm going to meditate all day anyway. It's been on the calendar. Um, but if you are stoked about that, then thank you for helping me do the work of kind of processing that. This is a work in pro progress. Um, there are elements that I feel quite masterful of. And then there's an integration process. It's like, whoa, let's, let's ch check this out together. So that's the Compassion Alchemy system. Um, let me just look at my notes to see. I wanted to present a couple ideas at the very beginning. He says, my main purpose has been to design a full spectrum meditation course that helps one avoid spiritual bypassing. So if you wanted to know um, one of the places where a lot of these uh, challenges come about, either in um, that you do meditation, then it's so destabilizing that you just can't function. Um, often this is a result of having spiritually bypassed. One of the things that happens in meditation is it makes you more sensitive to what's going on within and without you. And it'll actually wake you up to your own illusions. And sometimes that's a rude awakening. So often when I am coaching people, um, I've had the privilege of being helping, being able to help coach people out of kundalini crises and spiritual emergencies. And often what we find is that underneath what's going on, what was catalyzed by the mantra or the breath work or whatever was often a piece of developmental work 
that got undone, that, that remained undone or got a clinch in it, or there was a wound in there and going back. And so with spirituality, sometimes we're so stoked to do the mantra or the breath work because it feels like we can just boom, skip that wound and not have to do it. I, I don't have to work out my shit with intimacy. I'm doing kundalini yoga now, and I don't even feel sexual or romantic feelings about anyone. It's fine. Okay, that's the mantra to watch out for. It's fine. It's not fine, bro. Come on. They taught us that in 12-step uh, programs, right? I think is where this comes from. You know, what is what does fine mean? Effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional, something like that. So um, if you hear that... <laughs> in this context, think I might be spiritually bypassing right now. Um, so I wanted to, um, I was inspired for my own purposes to develop a course that helps us avoid that sort of self-delusion process, right? Because awakening should be awakening. We should be illuminating, but we can use these same tools to actually be asleepening parts of ourselves, right? Um, so this is one of the ideas. Then to do so, um, I've told this story in the last couple classes, but um, I was in training for a job that I didn't take, uh, counseling youth who were going through some challenges. And the founder of this system had sort of set it up, um, how they were informed. They were drawing from uh, Piaget's work and Eric, Eric, these basic developmental psychologists, right? Um, and they had kind of set up these, these various stages of developmental tasks where one could go wrong and kind of develop these challenges, these restrictions, these points of pain within our emotional body or these places where our maturation kind of gets stunted at a certain spot. And I didn't like the job after I went through a bit of training, but the system was like, oh, it just made this light bulb go off. And I was like, this is we i think it would be cool if we mapped our um spiritual work our work of spiritual development or introspective development or contemplative whatever word you like um onto the map of actually developing a healthy sense of self developing a healthy sense of self um, a number of years ago i was studying a uh, school of tibetan yoga and by wonderful grace. One of the teachers, one of the lamas was also a highly trained institutional organizational psychologist. This is one of the fields of psychology. And he was big into positive psychology. And the way he talked about kind of an integral postmodern spiritual path was, here's where all the ancient traditions live. And they're all about ego dissolution. And then underneath those should be where all the developmental psychology is. And this is all about creating a healthy ego, right? And if you have both of these, you can do a pretty good, healthy and integrated meditative path. But what a lot of us do in the West, because we have sort of culturally appropriated a lot of these Eastern practices, they don't actually fit straight from the culture of origin into the culture that is receiving them in the best cases we're not appropriating them we're we're actually receiving them but they still they don't quite fit and so for us many of us will need to know how do my particular attachment wounds play into why i want to not be a self so bad right if you're into zen or something you're like oh yeah non-self that sounds great that may, instead of being a high spiritual urge, instead of you being a reincarnated master, that might just be you with severe attachment trauma. We should, we might want to know that before our practice deepens. <laughs> and so that's kind of what we're working with here. Um, the other thing I was inspired by is as I looked at those stages, um, this was in the midst, some of the folks here are in my uh, level two uh, Qigong training. And um, we were in the midst of going through a whole communication training about that. And this sort of flash intuition, I was about to teach a class and all at once I was like, here's what the class is about. <laughs> you know, that's what it looks like when I get a flash of intuition. Oh. 
That's why I don't ever do it. I get a flash of intuition on camera because uh, I think it looks silly. But um, in my mind, the these stages of psychological development mapped perfectly on the elements of um, Himalayan yogic tradition, which are in dissolving order, earth, water, fire, wind, and space. So that's the model. It's, it's not concrete. It's not right or wrong, more right than somebody else's model. Um, it's just the model that hit me like a ton of feathers. Um, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, as a map for how to integrate some of the work of avoiding spiritually bypassing, understanding ourselves, and, you know, maybe some of the, the traumas or the unique formative factors that will inform our path of growth, our personal unique path of growth, um, and making a map so that the thing isn't like, like, if you've seen me for the last month preparing for this class, You'll see me looking at Terry O'Fallon's stages model and Ken Wilber's integral model and uh, Jean Piaget's four stages and Maslow's pyramid and uh, Cook Greuter's thing and Jane Lovinger's thing. And, you know, there's all these maps. And that's not even starting on, you know, the Mahamudra maps and the Dzogchen maps and the Zen stages. Um, so my... What I hope to make a nice contribution is you just go, here are five elements. They focus on something uh, unique in each element. And if you stack them all up, you've got a well-rounded path of meditation that integrates the psychological, but without having to be like focused on trauma all the time, because this is not a trauma work system, right? If you want, if you need to focus on trauma all the time, by all means do, that's not meant to be derogatory, but you know, you don't want to have to do that in your meditation practice necessarily, <laughs> but also not focusing on just trying to get another fundamentalist view so that you can feel comfortable, right? It's somewhere with a map to integrate all of these experiences that might come up on the path. So the uh, earth element where you start um, is all about calm, is all about calm. And these are the earliest stages of child development or ego development in which for to vastly oversimplify um, all of the literature, we're working with cultivating secure attachment. Okay, so step one, earth element. I have five C's in this system to make it memory worthy. Um, this C is calm and it's about developing secure attachment. So when we do this in meditation, this is all about self-compassion practices, nervous system regulation, all the stuff that people are learning. Here's how you hack your vagus nerve. That's all step one. Because if you can't do that, you're kind of lying to yourself about any other meditative attainment. Um, there's actually a famous story. Do you want to hear it? Yes, let's do story time. Um, and this was about which master was this? Uh, it was one of the great siddhas whose name is escaping me. I'll come up with it later. Anyway, it was a master of calm abiding meditation. This is where kind of, if you took that earth element calm to its ultimate extent, you could just like shut down, like go into suspended animation almost. That would be neat. Okay, so he was a master of this. And the story goes, his wife's making him a radish soup. And yeah, okay, it's old patriarchal gender roles, I know. But th that's what was happening back then. Um, and he says, okay, babe, just going to meditate for a little while. I'll, I'll wake up when the soup's ready. So he goes into meditation. He goes deep. He goes deep as hell. And 12 years later, according to the tale, his eyes pop open. And his wife says, oh, welcome back. And he smells. And there's, no, there's nothing cooking. And he gets pissed. He says, woman, where's my radish stew? And she looks at him and goes like, 
Dude, you've been in suspended animation for 12 years, and the first thing you think of is, woman, where's my radish stew? And you're going to yell, you know, because she was highly developed too, right? You're going to yell at me about this? And, okay, and then he gets ashamed. Oh, of course, and he decides, I'm going to go off to the mountain cave. My meditation isn't deep enough. I'm going to go into solitude and and try. And she smacks him across the face and goes like, Oh, so 12 years in silence wasn't enough. Now you're going to go off into a cave. Obviously, what you've been doing so far hasn't made you a kinder person. How do you think that more of the same is going to do the trick this time? It's a good story. <laughs> it's very attuned to what we'll be doing today. Um, so in this, in this case, why that story comes to my mind is that there are people who can hold their breath for a really long time. And then they finally take another breath. And the first thing they say is something a total jerk would say. And in my tradition of yoga, we go like, wow, what a waste of yogic discipline. What, like, you spend all this time learning to hold your breath, and then when you take some life force back in, the first thing you do is break the vow against harsh, harsh speech. Like, come on, brah. Um, and yes, in the chat, we are human. True. And if we spent some of that time that we spend cultivating, oh, I can focus for hours. I just take a little modafinil and a little bit of that ADHD drug. And then I focus for hours and I wrote a great book. If we spend a little bit of that time, like learning the art of kindness or healing some of our hair trigger um, neurology, we might be less fragmented. This is one of the things that can happen through these practices is you'll get these yogis who have these just like really sexy yoga butt and they're like, they're, they flow so well. And that part of their life is totally unconnected to how they treat other people or even how they talk to themselves when they are alone, right? You know, they're doing spiritual things and they may be doing them as a form of body dysmorphia. But that's a tangent. We were on calm. I didn't get very calm while I talked about that, excuse me. Um, but some of these things are these deep early attachment wounds. And you can you can grow, you know, there are successful people out there, highly, some of the most successful people, especially politicians we know, are deeply traumatized at this level of their being. But we'll find we're they are also deeply fragmented. And so what we want to do on our meditative path is we want to make the foundation one of comfort and kindness to self and others. So that's where we learn progressive relaxation. We learned, oh, breathe out twice as long as you breathe in. We did an eye movement orientation exercise to get into the, get kind with the present moment. We did the butterfly hug for this bilateral EMDR kind of uh, stimulation thing. Ah, we did the meditation on calm. This is the foundation. This is our earth element. And it takes us way back to this like zero to seven years old zone. Okay, so roughly, this is about zero to seven years old um, is where that works on. Then from about seven to 13-ish, these, these are... These are foggy numbers. Um, they they accordion a little bit like Weird Al. So um, your next goal, your next task is to actually develop a functional sense of self. And this is like in Piaget's system, this is actually where you're starting to develop a theory of mind and understand that like other people in the world have thoughts too. And, and that by reflection, you actually develop some, some theorists feel that by developing a theory of mind out there, is what develops like your persona or your sense of an in, in, inside personality. Um, so that's all happening. And in this system, um, we talk about that in terms of consolidating a healthy sense of self or consolidating a center of gravity, consolidating a center of gravity. So traditionally, this is where all of like the Zen comes in. Let the mind, the thoughts settle because a lot of the thoughts are noise. Did you notice? Please raise your hand if I'm not alone in that. A lot of the thoughts that go on doo, 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 are just noise. 
oh, I remember we have one of those folks, those cool folks who doesn't have an internal monologue, which is so unique and interesting. Okay, but for the rest of us, a lot of the thoughts, blah, 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 they're just noise. Okay, and then even if you don't have that, a lot of when we think on purpose, a lot of that crap is going to be mom's voice or uh, President Clinton's voice or whoever it was that got in there. It may not actually be you thinking or choosing or intending. So there's a whole phase in meditative paths where they go back and sort of like clean up the personality development process, which you did as well as you could way back when you were seven. And they go, what kind of persona, what kind of self would you like to consolidate? Right? You're not really going to be able to function without a consolidated self, um, even when it comes to dissolving the sense of self in deep meditation. You kind of have to have one to dissolve first. Um, so this is phase two, and its C word is curious, is curious. And the reason how that relates is that it's developing um, in Mahamudra, this is what they call the view in meditative system. It's, it actually means where you're viewing from or the, like the viewpoint, the point of view. Um, so it's consolidating this quiet, loving sense of I am. And we start with that down in our lower tummy. And from that, it makes it less likely that you have to project your assumptions and biases on the world because you know who you are. You know where you're coming from. And so you can be curious. You can actually open out into the world, which is um, the yogi's view of what this water element is all about. It. The water element is reflective. When you calm the waves, it reflects the world. It doesn't have any agenda. It doesn't have any bias. They call it mirror-like wisdom. So I call that curious. And then finally, <gasps> then I get to stop talking and we get to do a practice. Uh, finally, you find yourself in the fire element and its C word is compassionate. Compassionate. And in that you have the word passion, which, okay, in Latin means suffering. Um, but it also comes in Greek, it's pathos, which like in drama, in the theater, that's the expression of emotion. How do we bring emotion onto the path? This is a very sort of yogic phrase, taking it onto the path. And you'll see that in kind of, I would say more foundational spiritual systems, um, what they do is they try to keep the emotions off the path. Oh, you're angry? No, no, don't do that so much. Calm down. They're trying to help you consolidate that sense of self that's not so reactive. In that place, it's a good thing. But in, in relationship with your uh, intimate partner or best friend, for example, um, you get a phenomena that I call Zen boyfriend, which is someone comes to you with a need for emotional uh, connection and you sort of explain why they also need to calm down. Emotions aren't real. Emotions are coming from thoughts which are just made up, they're projections. And you're not being as kind as you think when you're being a Zen boyfriend. And usually this comes from an, in, an inability to be centered and open-hearted with whatever arises. So our work today, and I'll tell you later what, what developmental state this relates to, so I don't have to keep talking at you. Um, but our work today is this work of learning to remain open-hearted regardless of whatever is arising. I think that sounds like a pretty pretty agreeable goal, right? Like most people could agree that, that was, that's a good deal, right? It's not always easy in practice, <laughs> but it is a good deal. Um, last thing on this, in our last episode, we played with consolidating a sense of self down in the lower tummy. And this is related in your first steps in Zen practice. Um, a lot of it is breathing into the hara, that's lower belly. In martial arts practice, a lot of the time, you have to learn how to identify where's that center of gravity. And then in the inner, inner alchemical practices in Taoism and in some of the Tibetan yogas, 
they also start with this focus on the lower energy center. Most likely, it's because that allows any extraneous thoughts and thoughts up here, emotions in here to settle down and you can experience quiet. But also because it's in your center of gravity, it has the sense of like, and I am a coming down to earth that settles you in the somatic sense that we want for that uh, water element. In this episode, in the alchemical traditions, this is often where they'll start to work with the heart center. And this is part of where it's nice to have a map because in the Taoist system, for example, they say, don't work with the heart center too early before you've learned how to calm down. Otherwise, you'll open up the heart and then all of these afflictive emotions will just sort of rush in and um, kind of monopolize your attention or throw you off balance. Um, so they, they're very, now don't worry too much about that. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're not sure if you've consolidated your Dantian, you're going to be fine if you open your heart. But in their advanced alchemies, this is how they describe it. Um, a practical way of thinking about this is if somebody teaches you some of these yogic uh, principles of like altruism and self-abnegation before you have a healthy sense of self, you can actually be engaging in a form of very um, gullible and naive compassion toward others. You can become an enabler instead of an awakener, right? So this is where they say, oh yeah, consolidate the lower belly, center of gravity, me, I am, a healthy sense of I amness. And then you open up into a healthy sense of we are-ness um, of this heart opening. So that's where we're at in the fire element is this heart opening. Hopefully that's given you a little orientation to today's material, enough for intro, and then we'll play with it as we go. Let's do a little practice together, shall we? We're gonna do about a 15 or 20 minute sit before we take a break. So um, find your spot. And what we're going to do, we're going to do the inner smile meditation, um, and then the meditation on the pearl in the lower abdomen. So some of you know these. Um, the inner smile is very similar uh, for those of you who are in module one to the progressive relaxation. It's just kind of a Taoist version of that. Um, and then the little pearl and the dantian. These are ways of reviewing the previous steps to set us up for today. So you can be sitting up like in an upright meditation style, or you could be leaning against the back of your chair. You could even lie down or be in the lazy boy if that suited you best. So let's find our posture of repose, comfort and repose. <sighs> if you're sitting up, stack the crown of your head, right over your pelvic floor. So the force of gravity falls right through the middle of your body. Let's take a couple of sighs, which I recently saw a little research cited by Andrew Huberman, my favorite podcaster currently, which showed that they found the sigh is one of the most regulating forms of breath work, like it beats out the box breathing and some of these other ones. So just what you already know how to do. <sighs> and then let's also do a little of the two one breathing. So that's inhaling for let's say a three count, you exhale twice as long, so that would be six. Inhaling three. Exhaling six. Do it again at your own pace. Good, and letting that go, breathing normally. We'll take a moment of basic mindfulness, 
So feeling your body, what does my body feel like? Perhaps in general, that can be things like tired or excited or heavy or light. And then maybe in particular, are there any spots that stand out? Spots that are painful or spots that feel particularly good or even neutral? Oh, and just for fun, let's do this. This is actually an orientation technique. See if you can find a place in your body that feels pleasantly neutral. As you just scan through your body, does any place feel pleasantly neutral? And if it does, just rest your mind, savor that experience. Neutrality can be so grounding and just easy. Okay, then letting that go, we'll continue our basic mindfulness, just noting the breath, not inducing any breath pattern or anything like that, just noticing my in-breaths and my out-breaths. What are they like? And then take note of the mind. Are there images playing in the mind or not? Are there thought words or sounds or songs or not? Does your mental awareness have a tone to it, like curious or grumpy? or loving or not. Then as feels good to you, see if you can invite yourself to feel all three of those at the same time, the body, the breath, and the mind. Then beginning our practice of the inner smile, perhaps imagining the face of someone who you really love or who you feel really loves you. And sometimes that's not available to all of us. So you could imagine a archetypal figure or a deity, the universe or nature, or you could forego that entirely whatever works for you. But if you can, have this sense that like a loving force is radiating to you. And if you can imagine it smiling to you, even better. Then quirk up one corner of your mouth and the other and smile back. See if you can cultivate that sense of love and loving presence, appreciation and gratitude. And then almost like this external imagined force of blessing is shining to you and your own smile is shining to you. You begin this inner smile meditation from the Taoist tradition. So it goes through your inner organs. You want to smile from your mouth through your tongue. And they say there's a meridian that goes from the tongue right down to your heart. So we'll imagine that you can smile and send this feeling of love and compassion, of grace, of gratitude, down through the tongue, as if there were a meridian that went all the way down, and then smile into your heart. This is your physical heart, slightly on the left of center in your chest. Just imagine like 
the universe or your own intention or even both of those flowing into your heart with this sense of love and gratitude and well-being. And from the heart, the awareness flows out laterally into your lungs. Imagine directing this smiling, peaceful, joyful, grateful awareness into the lungs. like a blessing. And we're following the order of an old Taoist tradition. So next from the lungs, you smile down under the right ribs where your liver is. You smile into the liver. This is like an inner blessing of the organs of the body, or maybe even a gratitude practice. At the very least, a sense of relaxation. From the liver, you smile across to the other side of your rib cage where your spleen and pancreas are, as if through your attention and intention, you could spread that blessing and relaxed feeling into the spleen and pancreas. And from there, you smile back in the body into your kidneys, which are just underneath the rib cage in the back near your spine on either side. Smiling into those kidneys as if you were directing like a wave of blessing or relaxation, perhaps gratitude. Feeling as if these inner organs were being helped to be their best self. And then finally from the kidneys, smiling all the way down into your pelvis and into the organs of the reproductive system. Of course, throughout life, some of these organs may have been changed or removed through surgery or injury, and that's okay. You just smile to the version you imagine in sort of like the energy body. The sense of a blessing and being their best self. Then letting that go, we come back to the face and we refresh that sense that like the universe is smiling to us, like a blessing force is coming to us. And so obviously we smile back. And then you're gonna gather a little saliva in your mouth. This is this traditional Qigong practice so that you can swallow. And as you swallow, you imagine that you swallow that smile and it travels down your esophagus all the way down into your stomach. So now you smile into your stomach, sending that sense of blessing, ease. And then from the stomach, without having to know exactly where all these pipes are, just know that 
The stomach goes into your small intestine, which fills up the majority of your belly. So you can just smile into the intestines and the stomach area, the belly as a whole. Sending this wave of blessing, comfort and ease. From the small intestine down near your right hip, it turns into the large intestine. Again, you don't have to be too particular with your anatomy, but the large intestine flows up the right side of your abdomen, across under your ribs, and then down the left side of your abdomen. And you could just smile to the whole of your colon. And then after that left rib, it makes a little S and then it goes out through the rectum. And you can imagine as you smile, your body releases any psychic or emotional toxins down into the earth like compost, leaving through the lower gates of the body. Let all that go. And then one more time, we return to the face. We feel and imagine like the universe is smiling to us or imagining the face of a friend or a loved one. We bring that sense of love into our own face. And this time you direct that smiling awareness into your brain. The left brain, the right brain, the forebrain and the midbrain. Feel as if the whole brain becomes blessed and relaxed. And then this smiling awareness begins to travel down your spinal cord, through the neck and the torso, the low back, even through the sacrum and to your tailbone. From the spinal cord, this smile travels out through the nerves and reaches every part of your body. So your entire body is filled with this wish for thriving, the sense of blessing, this sense of comfort and ease. We're gonna smile into our lower belly area and feel the entire bowl of your pelvis even all the way up to your belly button, like this whole area was a big bowl or a big ball. And with your mind, feel somatically into the middle of that bowl or the middle of that ball, which is where your physical center of gravity will be. They usually talk about it as being three or four inches below the belly button but then back in the center of the body near your spine. And just imagine in this area, a luminous pearl of light, like a little spot of light spinning and spiraling. It spins in any direction that it wants to. And it's a pearl because it's white, which is the union of all the colors, but it also has that rainbow sheen, like a pearl gives off, showing the luminosity and the radiances in all their glorious diversity. And as we sit for a few more minutes, just let the awareness settle down into this pearl Almost like as it spins, it exerts a type of gravity, which consolidates your body and mind and breath down into the center of the lower abdomen.
And as you're ready, you can let that visualization go. And we'll be mindful for just another moment, feeling your body on judgmental awareness of your body. Noticing your breath. Noticing your mind. And for just a moment, hosting all three of those together. And then give your mind the gentle suggestion to begin arising from any deep states of meditation you might have entered into. Let the breath start to deepen. And to practice transitioning with a relaxed nervous system. Let's do a few of those two one breaths. So it's inhaling for half the time, like for a three count. Exhaling for a six count, twice the length. Then letting that go. You can begin to deepen your inhales a little bit, which tends to stimulate the awareness. And when you're ready, you can lift your gaze, let your eyes open if they were closed, and we'll come all the way back. Oh. Hey, round one, complete a little quick 20 minute practice of the inner smile and the luminous pearl in the lower Dantian. So let's um, chat about this for just a couple minutes and then we'll go on our first little break. Inner smile meditation, wasn't that, isn't that fun? Yeah, yeah, super fun. Classic Taoist practice and you obviously don't have to go in that order. But if you want to, now you've got a video that will lead you right through it when you come back later. So uh, good news. Um, yeah, and it's a practice of our basic principle of meditation, which is intentionally directing our attention. Intentionally directing our attention. This is what we're practicing in any kind of meditation, even the formless ones. We're directing our intention, attention to be open. <laughs> um, so we're combining that. And then this is also a neat, like meridian based form of self compassion practice. More on that in a little while. Let's see what else we got here. Most success I've ever had with the inner smile. Yes, you're in the right place is what that means, obviously. Um, or maybe the astrology's right, or who knows what makes them work. But anyway, let's celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and perhaps it felt forced before. So one thing I am proud of in my style of teaching meditation is that I one day I figured out for me that it really works to have a sense of like savoring and allowing and enjoying. And then meditation, like totally different heckin' thing. And a lot of what we find out there, it's changing now, which is kind of cool. But a lot of what I found out there in the olden days was like, now put the mind on the breath. 
now smile to your gallbladder and make it happy. It's like, don't, it don't work that way. So maybe that uh, did it. Anyway, that's my speciality. So warm energy up and down the spine. Ooh, delicious. When you, it was that when you did the spinal uh, part, Jim? Yeah, cool. So directing energy or directing attention in the ancient world, they called, often called directing energy. Um, now this one type of energy is not something we've been able to measure scientifically, you know, like, oh, that's the chi. But the living energies of our sensations and our emotions are undeniable in direct experience. And those change according to how your attention changes. So neat heckin' stuff can happen when you direct your attention. So I love hearing about this. What else have we got here? I train my dog to tune in to when I meditate. She was all jumpy and playful. And then when I said, ah, cool. So the dog joins the vibe. So lucky to have my inner smile invoked outwardly. Yeah, yeah, if you've got a, a doggo, they are great for teaching this like unconditional joyful presence. Um, like, so uh, excellent training tool. And then we did the pearl. Yeah, so pearl, spinning galaxy pearl. How was that for folks? Did y'all enjoy the pearl meditation? So just a brief touch in. We did that as our final meditation in the last module. Um, we did about, I think we did about a 20 minute on the pearl. Um, so um, we'll be using that, that imagery a bit today as well. So if you didn't get enough last time, there's going to be more alchemical pearlescence this day, my friends. All right. Uh, any questions on those practices? Uh, feel free to chat or just come on um, and talk or raise your hand and be called upon, whatever you like. Um, but anything to say, questions or comments or insights on the inner smile, the great luminous pearl. All set? Excellent. So good. You did great. You did your first meditation practice. Let's see. I noticed about that one. That was so nice because my thought words just calmed right down. I like long ago, I discovered that Taoists meditated by doing things inside. And that was a lot easier than just trying not to do anything inside. Um, and so I've, I love this inner smile because it's just like the mind just, oh yeah, you're just going to flow through these organs. You're going to, and it's like so calmative. Um, so yeah, felt very restorative to me too. I think I have uh, ADD. Yeah. Hard time concentrating and paying attention to what I'm seeing or hearing. Yeah. And this is a um, power, can be a powerful insight. Remember our last, oh, some of you don't, um, but in our first module in the earth element, we spoke about that meditation practices, contemplative practices can't exist all alone. You have to take your meds, meaning meditation, exercise, diet, and sleep, but sometimes also meds. <laughs> like if you have diabetes and you meditate without taking your insulin, you're probably going to have a hard meditation, bro. Um, I, I read a guy's book who participated in a study where they um, deprived them of insulin and watched their mental capacities um, devolve. And he um, agreed to participate because he was an advanced meditator. And so he could keep presence and tell them what the subjective side of that, like that's a trip. But for the rest of us, just take your insulin. Come on. <laughs> um, and then similarly, um, if we're coming, this, I love that you mentioned this because some of like, we are neurologically diverse as humans, right? When our, you know, proto chimp ancestors were coming up, you needed some really aggressive ones and some peacemaker ones, and some that were up in the middle of the night, and some that were asleep in the middle of the day, and vice versa. And you, you need the whole spectrum, right? And so it would be silly for us to think that any kind of meditation would work for every kind of neurodiversity, right? The, st the standard version that we call neurotypical, which may or may not exist, and then, you know, every aspect of the autism spectrum and every aspect of the ADD, ADHD spectrum and, you know, all of introverts and extroverts, you're going to need totally different tactics. But 
we also know that sometimes diet can affect the capacity for uh, attention. I de we definitely know that sleep can affect the capacity for attention. Um, and so a holistic practice of meditation would involve all of these, right? Um, the type of meditation you do, what else is going on in your life. And um, it's, really, it's really fun to note these things. All right, shall we take a break? Let's take a little tea break. We come back, we'll do a little theory, a lot more practice, and that'll be fun. So my clock says 1142, that's in the Pacific Standard. And let's come back then at, um, what is it? 52, uh, 58, <laughs> let's come back at 58 after the hour and we'll get on with the show. So see you then.